The unmistakable voice of the late Freddie Mercury, lead singer of the band Queen. But what is less well known about Mr Mercury and yet equally distinctive about him is that he was born into a family of Zoroastrians and was proud of his Zoroastrian heritage. Come to my aid, O Mazda. Come to my aid, O Mazda. Come to my aid, O Mazda. I am a worshipper of Mazda, a Zoroastrian worshipper of Mazda. I profess myself to be his devotee and ardent supporter. I praise good thoughts. I praise good words. I praise good deeds. I praise the good Mazda worshipping religion. A short extract from a Zoroastrian prayer recited by Yazad Bada, resident priest at the Zoroastrian Centre in London. So what is Zoroastrianism? Well, it's actually one of the world's oldest living religions. Indeed, it has claimed to be the world's first monotheistic creed and to have influenced major faiths such as Christianity, Judaism and Islam. But it often passes below the radar. So in today's forum from the BBC World Service, our mission is to get you better acquainted with a history of this ancient belief system. Joining me, Rajan Datta, are Dr Sarah Stewart, Shapurji Palonji lecturer in Zoroastrianism at SOAS, part of the University of London, Malcolm Debu, president of the Zoroastrian Trust Funds of Europe, the oldest Zoroastrian organisation on the continent, and Johan Vervina, professor of Sasanian studies at Oxford University. Um, maybe I could start by asking each of you, for the benefit of those who know nothing or very little about it, what's the essence of the faith? What's its core? In just a couple of lines, please. Uh, Johan first. So I would say that the essence of Zoroastrianism is to discriminate wisely. And by that I mean discriminate between good and evil. To basically think good thoughts, say good words and do good deeds. Malcolm. I think just to continue is primarily to assist God in defeating evil by doing good and to bring about the renovation of the world as it was during creation. And uh, Sarah, how would you summarise it, if you could? Well, I would also say that um, the core is really a profound dichotomy between good and evil. And um, indeed, there is one creator, God, um, however, there's a lot of debate, both within the community and outside, that there's an uncreated source of evil that's entirely separate from good. Well, I think we'll explore that that dualism, if you like, between um, evil and good uh, a bit later on in the programme. Now, you may have noticed the word Mazda in the short prayer we heard a moment ago. No, it wasn't a car brand, but one half of the name of the supreme deity in Zoroastrianism, Ahura Mazda. Mazda Yasna, meaning Mazda worship, is one of the names by which the religion is sometimes referred to. It's getting a little complicated already, so perhaps first we should clarify some of the names that you'll be hearing in this programme. Oh, and by the way, intriguingly, the car is named after Ahura Mazda, but that's another story. So, Malcolm, tell me, after whom or what is Zoroastrianism named? Well, it's after the prophet Zarathustra. But, of course, in the West, by the ancient Greeks, it was called Zoroaster. So that's the same name. Same name. So in Iranian, it's called, the original name was Zarathustra. But in today's Iranian or Persian, it's called Zarathusht or Zardosht. And, of course, in the West, uh, we are known as Zoroastrians after Zoroaster, that, which has exactly the same meaning. It's like Quan or John, to give you a different analogy. But the Zoroastrianism as such is also the belief in the one God, Ahura Mazda, who is truth, wisdom and light. It's also the belief of ideas of the immortal soul doing good to bring about uh, the last end of the world and the paradise that comes afterwards, the whole regeneration of the world. And geographically, where in the world was, was Zoroaster or Zarathustra living? As I understand, it's northeastern Iran, of northern Afghanistan, Central Asia. We're talking about around the Caspian Aral Sea, 
But because Zarathustra is so ancient, we are not exactly, cannot pinpoint that that is where he was. But from his, from the language and from his ministry, this is where we are, we are informed that's where he was. And we, we have to establish, for just very quickly now, he was a prophet. From a believer point of view, absolutely, yes. He had a revelation in which, uh, you know, he was able to sort of communicate with Ahura Mazda. Which is the... The, the one God, which is Zarathustra's proper name for God. Um, now, the other name we'll be hearing a lot is Avesta, and it's related adjective Avestan. Very briefly, what, what does that mean, Sarah? Well, the Avesta is the Zoroastrian holy book. What for Christians is the Bible, and for Muslims, the Quran. But it's, it's unique, and I think the key to understanding the nature of the Avesta is the fact that it was transmitted orally for centuries before being set down in writing, possibly as late as the 5th century of the Christian era. So we're looking at perhaps 1,500 years since the time of Zarathustra. And by the 5th century, the language of the Avesta, which is known as Avestan, was probably understood only by priests, and it would have been priests that uh, devised an alphabet um, especially invented for the purpose of writing down the sacred canon, reflecting the sounds of, of the Avestan words. Within the Avesta, only the Garthas, a corpus of 17 hymns, are attributed to the prophet Zarathustra. And these belong to an ancient Indo-Iranian tradition of wisdom poetry, and they're set in the ancient dialect, which is known as Garthic, or old Avestan. So this, this really makes the Avesta very unique. It's not prescriptive like parts of the Bible or indeed the Quran. These are um, rhetorical questions which Zarathustra addresses to his god, Ahura Mazda. So this is at the very core of the Avesta, the Garthas. And then the remaining texts are in young Avestan and represent a number of different historic levels. But unfortunately, the poor manuscript tradition, together with the fact that after the Arab conquest of Iran, many texts were destroyed, means that uh, of the great Avesta that was set down in the 5th century, only a third remains, and this is um, predominantly to do with ritual. But luckily, in the 9th century, we have another body of texts, and one in particular, the Dengkard, gives us a summary of the whole of the Avesta, which consisted of 21 divisions, or nasks, and they covered a wide variety of subjects, including medicine, astronomy, education, and law. And, of course, these texts were, were written way, way after um, Zoroaster himself was believed to have been born and lived. Tell me what we actually know about him, Johan. Well, it's a tricky question because we really are dealing with a prehistoric figure. So based on our linguistic analysis, we can see that the figure in the texts, in these Gathas, is described as a priest. This we do know. And um, these are hymns of praise to Ahura Mazda. This we can see. And a rejection of the Daiwas or the demons. So this is the some, demons were who? That's a it's a tricky question. Uh, perhaps the old false gods and such. Because we're talking but, about polytheism before this. Aren't yes, we? yes. And uh, it's worth keeping in mind, as Sarah said, you know, we have seventeen hymns in these five Gothic poems, and just as a as a comparando, when we look at the Rig Veda in the Indian tradition, we have a thousand and twenty eight hymns. So it's a very different amount of material that has survived which makes our interpretations highly uh, problematic at times. I mean, can we definitely be sure that he existed? No. But what we can say is that the Zoroastrian tradition has always understood the Gathas as, in some sense or the other, connected with Zarathustra, because in the later materials they're described as of Zarathustra. And since the, the Gathas have always been the foundational text, so to speak, of the Zoroastrian tradition, and he is the a f sort of a founder figure in that sense. Uh, it's the best we can do. But this is always the case for anyone prior to the advent of writing in whichever culture we're looking at. And there is legend, if you like, or historical um, recounting of him, that he was a family man, that he had children, and all this stuff. As well. Absolutely. Um, but very importantly, he is not to be worshipped, is that right? No, he's, in many senses, he's sort of the exemplar of the best 
poet sacrificer. The poets who compose these ecstatic poems in praise of the various deities and rejecting the evil forces. And um, in that sense, what we can see with Gothic language and also linguistically and in terms of poetry is it's the highest form of poetic ability. Incredibly complex works, incredibly well put together and constructed poems. So we're clearly dealing with an extremely sophisticated mind. And just to completely get this firm, uh, Johan, how far back can we reasonably be sure that Zoroastrianism goes? So, again, this is a fundamentally a linguistic question. And what we can see is that the oldest sections of the Avesta, the Gathas, are linguistically virtually the same stage as the earliest sections of the, the Vedic corpus in India, the Rig Veda. And so based on a, a relative chronology, plus minus 1500 BC, I think would be a fair, a fair assumption. But I know also that in terms of recorded history, we're talking about uh, Herodotus. And, and, and the, that's a thousand years later. And that's a thousand years later, yes. Plus minus. So in, in that sense, by the time we get to something that we can call recorded history and writing, this particular uh, faith tradition has already had a thousand years of evolution and development. It's a challenge. And Sarah, we also have some inscriptions from Persia carved into rock that are very old too, right? That's right. We have inscriptions dating from the Achaemenid period, so the period of uh, the same time as Herodotus was writing. And these were carved into the rock face at various sites near Persepolis, the city founded by the Achaemenid king Darius I. And these, these inscriptions give us some insights into the religion of the great kings of the Achaemenid Empire. Although they don't actually mention the name of Zarathustra, they do refer to their right to rule as being God-given, sanctioned, in other words, by Ahura Mazda. And one of the most famous is that of the rock inscription in Bisatun, which is a mountain near Hamadan, in which King Darius I proclaims that he's been made king by Ahura Mazda in this great earth, far and wide, a Persian of Aryan heritage. And just to clarify, King Darius I was? He was 522 to 486 BC. OK, well, we're going to hear more about the history of Zoroastrianism later on in this forum from the BBC World Service. But let's now turn to some of its practices. Malcolm, you've brought in a special kind of white uh, undergarment called Sedra or Sudra. Yes. Tell me about it. It's, it's a white shirt. Yeah, um, it's a white, it's a vest, as it says, the undergarment. It's made of sort of muslin cotton. It's got about nine parts to it. And just below the neckline, you've got a small pocket called the Giriban, and it's the pocket storage of good deeds. Because Zoroastrianism is a religion of action, because that's what counts at the end of the day when your soul crosses over after death into the afterlife. Now, at the back is a larger sort of like a semicircle behind your neck, and that's the larger sort of portion compared to the storage of good deeds, and that, we are informed, is the potential for everybody to do more good deeds. Because at the end of the day, as I mentioned, it's only your good words and your good deeds will carry you over into heaven as such. And does every believer wear that all the time? Yes, once we are initiated into the faith, both whether you are male or female, because both male and female are required to help our Ramazda to defeat evil. So hence, for instance, both of them undergo the same initiation ceremony when we are very young. So, for instance, amongst the Parsi community of India, it is about between seven and nine, while as for the Iranian community, goes back to the ancient times, it's more like approaching adolescence, about 15. Well, maybe this is a good place then to delve a little deeper into the basic ideas of Zoroastrianism. Um, I and mean, apart from doing good, thinking good thoughts and saying good words, which you've mentioned, Malcolm, do you have much choice? Do you have free will? Is that, is that an important part of the faith? Yes, you have the choice and it's up to us as human beings to decide because we have got our own mind to choose. But the more important thing is, although, yes, you have the freedom to choose, but at the same time, you are held accountable for your words and actions. And that must not be forgotten. You cannot then blame it on somebody else for your wrong choice. And Zarathustra emphasizes that you must select the right choice. Because if you select the wrong choice, then it is sort of misery and woe forever. 
So to, to illustrate that, here's an extract from the Avesta which explains the Zoroastrian belief in taking responsibility for one's actions. Listen to the best things and ponder with a clear mind the two choices. Everyone to decide for themselves and to declare themselves to Ahura Mazda before the Day of Judgment. In the beginning, two primal spirits appeared in the world, twins in a state of conflict. Two they were in thought, word and deed, the good and the bad. The people who possessed good understanding chose the truth, but those who possessed wicked understanding chose the lie and went astray. Would I be right in thinking that some of these concepts, for example, the idea of an afterlife in an either pleasant or unpleasant place, depending on one's earthly deeds, am I right in thinking that they found their way into other religions, Johan? Yes. If I can just go through a litany of things that will sound very familiar to many listeners. We have a Satan-like evil spirit. We have notions of heaven and hell. And we have descriptions of the journey of the soul, an immortal soul, as Malcolm said. We have a final judgment. We have apocalyptic events leading up to this final judgment. We have the resurrection of corpses of humanity, where they will basically return to their, their fully human form. And basically, the way that most of us understand this is that many of these ideas were very popular and circulated in the Achaemenid period. And when um, Cyrus defeated the Babylonians, and essentially freed the deported Jews there, that some of these ideas were picked up by Jewish communities, and when they were allowed to return to Jerusalem, you get the spread into the Abrahamic faiths that have essentially survived, and then secondarily and tertiarily in, term, in terms of Christianity and Islam and such. And, Sarah, I think there is also a group of Zoroastrian deities that resemble Christian angels. Well, in a sense, but they're, they're different from the angels of Christianity in that they were brought into being by Ahura Mazda, the wise lord, for a specific purpose. So in Zoroastrianism, the creation of the material world, which is alluded to in the Avesta, um, but given more coherent form in the later literature of the ninth century, the creation began with six benevolent divine beings known as the Amish Aspentas, or bounteous immortals. So they embody both the spiritual and the material aspect of each of their respective creations. So, for example, Ashavahishta, meaning truth or best righteousness, has fire for its material aspect. But what I think is an important point in the doctrine of the Amish Spenters is that each creation has its material and immaterial aspect, but also it's represented in the priestly act of worship, the yasna. So fire is represented in the ritual fire of the yasna ceremony. And it's also um, observed in everyday life of all Zoroastrians who pray before fire, in ancient times the hearth fire. Um, today it would be the sun by day and the moon by night, um, or indeed the fire in the fire temple. And uh, they keep fire pure. So this this is the way it works for each of the creations, whether water, earth, plants, the sky, cattle and man. They all have these many aspects. And I, I think the doctrine of the Amish Spenters knits together, if you like, all aspects of religious life, both spiritual and material in Zoroastrianism. Well, let's go briefly back to Zoroastrian ritual and look at another important part of the attire worn by believers. That's the, the kusti. And again, Malcolm, you've got one here. What happens with that? Well, primarily it is a cord, but it's not flat. If you feel it, it is sort of hollow, like a tube. And basically it signifies that both the physical and the spiritual world are one and thereby also demonstrating that your thoughts, words and actions have not only impact on the physical world, but also on the spiritual world. 
And here, you see, I mentioned earlier that the sudre is made from cotton, which is plant kingdom, while the kushti is made from lamb's wool. Ancient times, we are told that it was made from camel's hair. So it's animal product. And if you think about it, Sarah was talking about the Amesha Spenters, the attributes of Aura Mazda, which are seven in question. Now, as a practitioner, as a human being, if you look at it, the first creation, for instance, is the sky, which is above you. The second creation is the water, which is within you. The third creation, namely the earth, you're walking on it. The fourth creation, the plant kingdom, is by wearing the sudre. The fifth creation is the animal, the kushti, which we are wearing, the animal product. Then the, se- the sixth creation is human beings, which is us, and namely, lastly, fire, which is again within us, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to live. So, so the idea is, again, by wearing the sudra and the kushti, which are seen as the armor, the protector against uh, evil, we are seeing the holistic view of then going out, because Zoroastrians, we are informed that we are seen as potential warriors assisting God to defeat evil, or the Asharvans, the sort of soldiers of truth. And the ritual, for instance, every time we untie and retie the kushti, the traditionally we are meant to do it at least five times a day, at the five watches of the day, which begins, the first watch begins at sunrise, and the last one's up near midnight. So every time we do these prayers, the prayers remind us to do good, to speak good, etc., etc. Now, to the outsider, uh, Johan, it, it feels like ritual and ceremony are so important to the observance of, of Zoroastrianism. I mean, how does that affect people in, in the 21st century who are living other types of lives too, normal lives, if you like, regular lives? Well, this has been one of the great challenges of modernity in that sense. And I think it's worth keeping in mind that we look at the history of Zoroastrianism when we look at the knowledge production that we have in terms of texts and commentaries and such, what we are looking at is a male hereditary priesthood. So it's not really the full cross-section of society. So this makes it a bit challenging when we talk about the past, because the past, by a certain standard, would always seem more conservative to a more pluralistic society. But in a sense, ritual is, is the binding force historically, through time, because that's how the sources present themselves. And of course, now, as we are entering an age where things are far more deritualized, and we have we'll, people live in diaspora, as notions of ritual purity have given way to notions of, let's say, hygiene, public hygiene, things and all these things have changed. And that's part of the great challenge for all living communities, is how do you take your past and make it consonant with your living Um, moment. Well, in terms of rituals and ceremony, that takes us to an element which is seen as an emblem of Zoroastrianism, and that's fire. And fire temples, they are perhaps the best-known symbols of Zoroastrianism, but Sarah, it's probably not correct to describe Zoroastrians as fire worshippers. No, well, fire is really a symbol. It's been likened to the crucifix in Christianity. You don't actually worship the cross but it's a symbol, and in that way, fire symbolizes truth, as I mentioned, and creative energy. Zoroastrians dislike being referred to as fire worshippers, which they often have been historically in a derogatory sense. Malcolm, what what does fire mean to you as, as a believer? Heat is important, fire is important. We just celebrate Nauru's, the new year on the vernal, the spring equinox. We call it like the Jamshidi Nauru's after the, the legendary King Jamshid, which is equivalent to said Noah of the Noah's Ark. And here is a person who sort of saves the world by assistance from God, but from the bitter winter. Unlike Noah, who had the flood, we had the bitter winter. And one of the challenges of the ancient humanity was to keep the fire going. And this was the important factor from our point. We managed to work out how to keep that fire going. So in a fire temple, for instance, once the fire is consecrated, it becomes into a living entity, is treated with reverence and respect, is treated with regal terminology. And when we go in, we bow. We take, for instance, uh, like a sandalwood, if you're in India, something aromatic as a gift to the regent. And from a historical perspective, the oldest fires in the fire temples in the Zoroastrian world can be traced back to the Parthian times, about two and a half thousand years, in the deserts of Iran, in Yazd. Or in, in the case of India, for instance, in a sleepy village called Udwada, which is in sort of southern Gujarat, about three hours train ride from Mumbai. 
There, the fire has been installed for over a thousand years, which was consecrated by the first religious refugees who came from Iran. So imagine this fire. So these are fires that just gone on constantly and on. burning. Yeah, mm. although the buildings have changed, the initial core fire, the embers, is still the same. But you see, they're not like bonfires. They are put in more in ember form. Of course, when when the ritual feeding comes, where the where the priest, the fire priest, is looking after, he feeds the fire with wood. Obviously, yes, there is uh, the flame is higher, but in most times, it is in embers, and people go to the fire to seek uh, boons, to seek blessings. So there are issues like, for instance, if you've been the lottery, you go and thank the fire. But at the same time, say, for instance, you've got difficult times, you go and ask the fire, and it's through the fire communicating with God. So this is where by the early question about the fire worship thing. You're not physically worshipping the flame per se. It is through the medium of the fire you're worshipping okay. God. Okay. But obviously very, very central to, to yes. Zoroastrianism. Well, here's an extract from a litany to fire read by Yazad Bada, the resident priest at the Zoroastrian Centre in London. O fire, son of Ahura Mazda, grant thou to me well-being immediately, sustenance immediately, long life immediately. Well-being in abundance, sustenance in abundance, long life in abundance, greatness, wisdom, fluent tongue and understanding for my soul, and intellect that improves steadily and does not diminish in strength. Well, we've looked at ritual and we've looked at the origins. Um, but, Johan, let's look at the heyday of Zoroastrianism, which was uh, in the Persian Empire. Tell me about that. Well, we really are looking, in a certain sense, at three Iranian empires. We're looking at the Achaemenids, the Parthians and the Sasanians. And uh, what we can see is that the Sasanian period is when Zoroastrianism best fits the definition of being something like a state-sponsored religion. It's also the period when uh, the Zoroastrian priesthood are in their most muscular moment. And uh, one of the things that we can, we can see is that in the Sasanian period, we're living, it's a major multicultural empire. Just give me a rough idea as well. When are we talking about here? The Sasanians are basically 224 to 651 CE. Which is the same as AD. Yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> yeah. And in that sense, uh, the um, Zoroastrian Persians ruled over a variety of different religious communities who lived within the Sasanian Empire. So we have Jews, Christians, Manichaeans, Mazdakites, Mandeans. We have various pagan groups and, of course, not to mention uh, Hindu and Buddhist groups in the eastern part of the empire. But it would also be fair to say that, that Orthodox Zoroastrians occasionally persecuted versions of Zoroastrianism that they they considered to be heretic. And you mentioned Mazdakism, and that, that, that was something that was regarded as, as a threat. Yeah, so Mazdak is one of the um, individuals who claims to be a founder of a, a, a sort of a new faith, or one could say perhaps um, a schismatic group within Zoroastrianism. These are hard questions to answer, of course. But uh, the the Persian and Arabic sources that do talk about him essentially say that he argued for women and property to be shared in common. And this, you know, is often sometimes referred to as the first communism. <laughs> and this was very, very controversial, especially in a patrilineal society where if you cannot tell paternity, then how do you do inheritance and things like that? And the Sasanians at some point were not so happy and it was... A challenging situation for the Mazdakites. Now, the turning point for the Sasanian Empire and for Zoroastrianism in Persia came in the 7th century AD. Tell me what happened, Sarah. Basically, the Sasanian Empire collapsed fairly rapidly in the face of the onslaught of Muslim armies, Arab armies. There's no single factor that one can point to, but we can perhaps suggest three main causes very very generally. First, Sasanian society was very stratified. The difference between the classes, the fact that they didn't cooperate with each other, uh, favoured the aristocracy, which included vassal kings of foreign origin, chiefs of great feudal houses, the head of the church, 
um, the fire temple priests and and so on. And so the lot of the ordinary, of the peasant, was not good. He was tied to the soil. He was bound to serve as a foot soldier in the many campaigns and also was liable to both um, land and personal taxation. And then there were prolonged wars with Rome, which began with the first Sasanian king, Ardashir I, and went right through to the 7th century in the Arab conquest of Iran. And these were expensive. There was very little gain on either side. And so by the time that the invasions began, um, Persian military might was dissipated, exhausted. And finally, people were, I think, pretty fed up with um, the interference of priests in every aspect of their lives. So the wealth and the power of the priesthood had grown substantially throughout the Sasanian period. And people were obliged to pay for a range of religious services from priests in addition to those which they would have expected to do, you know, which were concerned with rites of passage, um, birth, marriage, death, obviously, and the, the naujot or initiation to the faith. But they were expected to pay for all sorts of um, purification ceremonies and ceremonies to do with penitence and the saving of the soul. So really all these things combined um, meant that a succession of campaigns against the Sasanian Empire were successful and the last Sasanian king, Yazdegerd III, fled the country and is thought to have died in exile. He fled in 651. So basically the, the, the Sasanian Empire kind of Im imploded to a certain extent and obviously outside factors uh, like the newly Islamized um, Arabs mounting a succession uh, of attacks, that also affected everything as well. Mm. And that meant, uh, Malcolm, that, that certain rituals became more threatened too. And I'm talking about the other notable type of building. We've talked about fire temples, but also the other one that uh, is associated with Zoroastrianism are the rather cryptically named Towers of Silence, where some of the community will dispose of their dead. Just tell me some more about that, Malcolm. Once you're dead, your body was seen as pollutant or nasu, and thereby you could not intern into earth because earth is meant to be pure as a creation of the same thing, the waters and fire. So the Zoroastrians decided to initially dispose the body in the hills. So for the Herodotus mentions, the ancient Persians took the bodies away and it was devoured by wolves or whatever. Once we came into an urbanized situation, a tower was built. And they are initially they were built uh, outside the urban setting. But of course, as the cities have moved along, they've become part of the urban landscape. So what happens is that once you are dead, after the funeral ceremony has taken place, the corpse bearers would take the body, take it to the tower, there's a door. And the idea is that once the body is left there by the corpse bearers, the vultures are meant to descend and devour the body up very quickly and efficiently. And deliberately, it's set out so that vultures will come and, and devour the, yes, the remains. Because now, why is that are, a good thing? Oh, why it is a good thing? Because death is seen as a, as a temporary work of evil. Why? Because only the living are dynamic and that only the living can do good thoughts, good words, good deeds. So if you're dead, you're static. And the other reason was the Towers of Silence, which is very similar to what the Tibetan Buddhists practice or the Native American Indians practice, sky burial. They are seen as ecologically fair. And from our point of view, the last sort of uh, remnants where the Zoroastrians see that we're doing the charity to the birds, but at the same time, not polluting the creation. And as you say, it, the, being eaten by vultures is, is the cleanest, most efficient way of getting rid of, of, the, of the remains. Yes. OK, well, the decline in the use of the Towers of Silence is a sign of, of a broader retreat of Zoroastrianism. Tell me what happened in the centuries after the Muslim conquest of Persia, Johan. So essentially, you have a gradual retreat of Zoroastrian life from being the dominant group to a fully minoritized community. And um, there were periods, of course, when the relationships were more aggressive. There are periods when we have less material for it. And into the 19th century, you see quite a large amount of persecution as well. And in a sense, at some point in that process, in the first few hundred years, a small group of uh, Zoroastrians fled Iran and moved to India. That became the, the Parsi community. 
And so what is, I think, particularly interesting is that after, let's say, plus minus a thousand, we have two different communities who share a religion, but they don't share language, they don't share food, they don't share clothing. And what we have in the medieval period is this very fascinating epistolary exchange. There's letters written back and forth between them, communicating and asking for information one from the other as far as ritual practices and behavior. So classic example, the Indians write to the Iranians and said, can we cook with ghee? And the Iranians said, no. Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. Answer, no. And then, you know, can we wear Indian, you know, lungis? No, you must wear pants, you know, things like that. So, I mean, these are very useful and in interesting indexes for watching the acculturation of the Zoroastrian communities in the um, South Asian context. And Malcolm, as we have just said, the Zoroastrians chose to leave Persia and some of them created what is now the most numerous uh, Zoroastrian community, which is the Parsis of India. Tell me about them. Well, as Johan said, you know, the Parsis of India is a specific word given to them, in my opinion, by the Hindus of India, say the Persians. Because in India today, we have other communities which are Iranian. But when you say a Parsi, you're specifically designating a Zoroastrian. And what we are also aware is this, that Zoroastrians fled elsewhere as well. Uh, for instance, uh, the Sasanian uh, prince Firoz was given century in China by the Tang dynasty. But for one reason or the other, the Parsi community happened to survive in India. And fortunately, throughout the millennia, they did not suffer persecution initially by the Hindus, but also later on to a larger degree by the Mughals. Yes, there were these issues as well, but to a larger degree from the, with, the, with the Hindus, the, the Mughals, the British and the other Europeans, the Parsis in India have thrived. Sadly, in Iran, the case was the, Ira the Iranians, the Russian community was becoming more fragmented, more marginalized and coming to virtual wipeout. But Sarah, I think you've been doing some work on Zoroastrians today in their homeland of Iran? Uh, yes, I, I've just completed a project, in fact, that's run for some years. The aim of the project was to look at what's happened to Zoroastrians and their way of life, their religious lives in Iran uh, since the revolution and the establishment of the Islamic Republic. And so the result has been to collect uh, over 300 interviews, most of which are in the Dari language, which is um, the language that Zoroastrians in Iran still speak, particularly in rural areas, but most of them understand and preserve in their homes, even in the cities. And this is a language that is rarely written down, but it's been preserved for centuries, mainly, um, well, traditionally, because it was not understood by the predominantly Muslim population. And if I were asked what's sort of notable about them. I think it's the, the quintessential Iranianness. They feel very strongly Iranian. They're proud of their pre-Islamic history, but they embrace the poetry and the literature of poets such as Hafez, Rumi, Ferdowsi, and these, mm. these names come up all the time um, in conversation, which is interesting. It's, it happens a lot more than, you know, in India when you talk to Parsis. So would you say then, Yuhan, just finally, that the best hope for Zoroastrianism to, to flourish is in India with the Parsi community? It boils down to whether you think of Zoroastrianism as an ethnic religion or you think of it as a, a worldwide faith that has just not been able to spread due to persecution and discrimination. And you will get very different answers from people. Um, it's worth mentioning also that the Parsi population in India is also in quite significant decline. So uh, the census in 2001... I think, had the population around 69,000. And the census in 2011 now has it of around 50,000. And, of course, some of the decline is not just demographic in terms of older people and such, but it's also a lot of people have moved to uh, North America, to the United Kingdom, and also Australia and New Zealand. So, that, so some of these things have to be taken with, a bit carefully. But what is clear is that uh, the population may be declining, but the ideas, the concepts, the beliefs are obviously still very, very influential. Well, let me say thanks to Dr. Sarah Stewart, Malcolm Debu, Professor Johan Vivina and Yazad Bada. There are more programmes about religion and spirituality for you to explore and download for free on our website. Just head to bbcworldservice.com and look for Heart and Soul. 
But for today, I'll leave you with a wonderfully sumptuous theatrical vision of Zoroaster's world from the pen of the 18th century French composer Jean-Philippe Rameau.